Welcome to the Injection Connection, in-depth discussions with thought leaders and professionals in the polyurethane infrastructure repair industry, hosted by Jim Spiegel, Vice President of Alchemy Speed Tech and board member at the International Concrete Repair Institute. Hello and wel- welcome to episode two of the Injection Connection with myself, your host, Jim Spiegel. Um, in this episode, we're actually uh, playing for you a uh, a screen share presentation that we gave an engineering firm uh, regarding our uh, new patented uh, leak seal QA QC system, the QP factor. Uh, This system is the first patented method in the industry to actually quantify leak seal grouting and leak seal uh, effectiveness. So throughout this presentation, uh, you'll hear uh, some detail in that. Uh, This presentation was based on a technical presentation that was given at the International Concrete Repair Institute National Convention in Jacksonville, Florida in uh, 2019. So there may be some some topics of this that might be a little abstract or you might not follow completely well. Also, if you're if you're not watching via video, uh, you may you may lose uh, some of the content slightly. But um, hope this is of interest to you. If, if you do have more questions or need more details about it, uh, we'd be happy to do a future episode uh, based on this uh, with one of yourselves uh, as the host. So please just um, submit any any suggestions or ideas or questions uh, to jspiegel at alchemy-speedtech.com. That's J-S-P-I-E-G-E-L at alchemy-speedtech.com. I hope you enjoy episode two uh, of the presentation of the QP Factor Leak Seal Quantification System. Thank you. I'll, I'll give you this presentation. I'll, I'll go through it. I won't, won't go through every single aspect of it, but I will talk a little bit about some of the systems that we offer uh, that would be offered obviously to your firm as well as BART uh, that may differentiate ourselves a bit uh, in the chemical grouting world. So the video that you see here was actually taken from one of our training, uh, one of our grout labs. And as you can see, this is kind of a cross section of grouting. And is the video running for you, for you guys on your end? Yeah, uh, it's a little slowly, yeah, but it's going. Okay. So this is a cross section of, of grout that we did here. This drill hole that you see in the middle, um, with chemical grouting, you drill at a 45 degree angle and you intersect the substrate halfway through the thickness of the concrete. So in this particular uh, mock up, this grout lab, we're actually showing or recreating you know, a typical uh, cross section of a cracker joint. So as you can see, we do have expansive pressures. You see through the flow of the the off-gassing, the CO2, you have expansive pressures going to the front of the crack and to the back of the crack. And when you see the seal, the foam coming out of the face of the crack, it's also traveling to the back uh, that that you see here. So I I did give this presentation for uh, International Concrete Repair Institute at their national convention, as you can see back in uh, April. And this particular presentation is on a patented system that we are, um, it is patent pending right now uh, that we have, and it's the first QA, QC system in the chemical grouting industry. So that's that's what this covers. Um, I do sit on the national board of directors for ICRI, um, the International Concrete Repair Institute, and I am on the 710E grouting committee. So we are talking about some of these things in in those meetings. So I want to start off, this was the first slide. If you, can't, if you cannot measure it, you cannot improve it. Um, and I think this is really appropriate with chemical grouting. And, and to date, uh, with chemical grouting, there really is no QAQC. Even in the, <clears throat> the guideline that we're producing in the 710E committee uh, that we're revising this year and about ready to release, the QAQC is, is very vague and it, and it does require you know, some, <clears throat> some experienced applicators to be on site at all times, you know, to make minute to minute uh, adjustments and reaction times, mixing ratios, uh, application techniques. So we really wanted to bring quantification to chemical grouting. So in this particular presentation, these are the topics of discussion. Uh, We do some industry relevance, some history on chemical grouting, uh, the QP system, QP factor system. I go over some laboratory results, with crack injection, also did some laboratory results with water stop functionality. That is something for the purpose of this presentation. I can certainly skip over the water stop testing. That's not gonna be relevant to to our discussion here. I'll show you some field field results 
uh, that we have from for some crack injection results with the QP system. And then we had a really unique um, case study in San Diego gas lamp district where we did some integral grouting in brick substrates. And I'll talk about um, talk about that as well. Okay, so the history of this actually comes from the geotechnical um, geotechnical industry, and I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with with Lujan tests. Um, so I will open that up first of all. Are, are any of you familiar with with that testing, Lujan testing? Never heard of it. <laughs> no. Okay. All right. So Lujan testing comes from the, as I mentioned, comes from the geotechnical industry, and in this, you know, when they're when they're grouting, say, a, a mountainside, you know, let's say in, in the Alps where they're going to be putting in a, you know, a tunnel or a roadway, um, they do some of this really deep uh, hydraulic connectivity testing uh, in the rock. And what it entails is actually dropping an inflatable packer down into these test holes. And they take uh, water tests at these, uh, at these depths. And for every stage in that borehole, they're measuring water take and back pressure. And what that's doing is, is giving them a relative, um, a relative measure of connectivity <clears throat> within the, the soil. So I was actually at a, a, tr a grouting uh, course at the Colorado School of Mines a few years ago, and we were learning these principles. And I said to the, I, I asked one of the presenters if this had ever been applied to, you know, a much smaller substrate with, with poured concrete or masonry block or brick. And it had never, never been done. So this is where this, uh, this stems from. We're pretty much taking this large macro example of connectivity testing and we're applying it to, to poured concrete. So in that guideline that I mentioned with chemical grouting, this is the actual verbiage that, that exists right now um, in the guideline. So unfortunately lacking the type of detailed information required to analyze how the results were obtained, uh, further, a considerable amount of experience is required to such things as assess the problem and understand its causes, select the correct grouting material, and make minute-to-minute -minute decisions required on site. So, as you can see, even in the most <clears throat> technical, you know, group of of chemical grouters in the industry within ICRI, this is, um, you know, it's still kind of an art form and not necessarily quantified. So here's the, the system uh, that, that we could bring out on site and utilize for, for your particular project. Uh, we have used this on a few projects and um, you know, with, with very good results. As you can see, it's all encompassed in a Pelican waterproof case. Uh, that's a digital touchscreen readout, a little on off switch, and then the white circle in the middle is a little USB, a little USB card. So after we take our readings, you just simply put a USB in and it pumps out the results in Excel, Excel format. So we did a couple little uh, tests here, and and what we're what we're trying to do here is we're showing three scenarios. We have one, two, and three here. And um, Michael, are you able to see my pointer when I do that? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So in, in the first in the first version here, we just take a, a little paver, and this is a very rudimentary test, but we take a paver and we drill a drill hole halfway into this, but not the whole way through. So what we're trying to do is test essentially what would be considered a dead hole. You know, if we, if we drilled, if we made a drill hole into the, into the substrate and we didn't hit the crack or the joint, this is the type of result that we would get. And the second one, we, we made this drill hole the entire way through the, the top paver, and we just set this on top of another paver. So this is just an open channel, and we're trying to simulate just a crack or a joint, you know, in a, in a concrete substrate or a masonry substrate. Okay, so there's no sealant in that, obviously. And the third one, we actually made the drill hole the whole way through the top paver. And then we put our high foamer hydrophobic polyurethane material into the middle of that. So in the third one, we're, we're recreating a, an actual sealed crack or sealed joint environment. Okay. And then I have some videos here of taking the test, but for the, in the name of time, I'll skip through that and just get to the results. Okay. So here's, here's some of the graphical results that, <clears throat> that we see. So what we can do is we can, set the, we can set the readings to take a certain amount of readings with a certain duration. So in this case, I think I was taking 30-second uh, readings, perhaps, or maybe it was 20-second readings, the first five. So we were going from 19 to 31. I think we were taking then here, let's see, probably you know, 
15 second readings because I set a three second duration. So what this shows though, anyway, you can calibrate this to whatever you want. If we want to take one minute uh, water and flow tests at you know, 10 second intervals, you can set that all up in the configuration. But what we see here in location one, which was that first example, we see there was very little flow, obviously, because that was a dead hole. And we had very high pressures. And it automatically calculates this QP factor, which is flow over pressure. So the QP is, was zero in, the, in that case, and which would be anticipated because there was, it was a dead hole. There was no, no crack for water to flow through. In the second example, results six through 10, we see we had significantly higher flow rates, and this is in milliliters per minute. And the back pressures were very low. And the resulting QP factors were anywhere from, as you can see, 90 to 141. So at that second location that we did there, this is showing kind of an open crack scenario. So if we would go into the, into the tunnels and take some of these readings, you know, we'd anticipate seeing some of these sorts of, of values. You know, 100 is very, is very significant, um, but this is what we would see. In the third section, readings 11 through 15 was in our sealed condition. We see that we had a little flow here um, at the first reading, number 11. That could have been just from the, the line itself priming and filling with water. Um, but we quickly see that the pressures go, the flows go to zeros, the pressures um, go back to, to very high pressure hold with zero QP. So what we're looking for when we do this testing is a before and after testing. We, we, we want to test some of the, the cracks and joints before we do chemical grouting. And then we want to come back in and test them again after we do chemical grouting. And that's really where we want to show BART and, and the clients and the design team that this is how we've improved the, you know, the, the performance of your substrate. So I'm going to skip over this. This was some, some water stop testing that we did um, in <clears throat> injection tube scenarios. Um, we could go back to this and, and other topics, but again, in the name of time. I want to point out this, <clears throat> this slide. So um, we went out and we took some of these tests in an actual crack environment. So if you're looking at this picture here, the crack you can barely see, but the crack is running right, right along here. You see we have our ports that we set for injection of urethane, but we have our test ports over here. So it's important to note the placement of these test ports. We want to, we want to place the test ports halfway between resin ports. Okay, so we don't want to test anything right where we're injecting resin because you know, you're, you're going to essentially have a false positive. Of course, at the area that you actually inject resin, you're going to have a very good seal because that's at that area. The problem areas with chemical grouting are between ports. You know, it's when we don't get flow from this port the whole way up to this area. It's when we don't get flow from this port down to you know, this, this middle range area. So historically, <clears throat> the only the only QC, QA, QC that the grouting community has is observing this. You know, we see grout coming out of the base of the crack and we say, it's good. You know, we're getting- That was our QA before, there always has been. I'm sorry? I said that's always been our QA. Watch, yep. watch the crack itself as it starts to bleed and eventually bleed out grout. Yep, absolutely. And, you know, and typically, or at least what's available to the industry, you know, it's kind of what we have to do in the absence of an active leak, you know, where we can see the, the water actually being shut off from the grouting work. Yeah, this is the best, the best thing we have is observable measures to see the penetration. Yeah, so when we see material coming out here, we know that we've, we've sealed or at least have full penetration of the crack going in this, you know, back into the wall here along, this would be along a Z axis, you know, essentially. But these areas right here, you know, between coverages, that's really what, what we want to test with this. So in this particular project that we were on, we took four locations. And it's important to note the relative scale over here on the, on the y-axis. You see at location one, our first reading was about a 60. So that was a really significant leak. And our reading two, though, was still at a 20. So we, when we move on to location three, no, I'm sorry, two, three, and four here, you see the relative scales were much lower. You know, these are only going up to three, three, and 1.5. So th these areas were not as bad of a leak, um, you know, to start with, okay? So that's important to note. But on location one, we actually had full, full observable penetration of grout 
But when we took our second trial after we grouted, we were still getting right here at about like a 22 QP reading. So this is really important to note because it, you know, without this system, you would walk away from this and say, okay, well, we had our travel of grout the whole way, it's sealed. But when we put it under our water test, we saw that we were still getting QPs of over 20. So we knew immediately at this location, for instance, we had to do, we had to grout again. So we drilled another hole. Um, we actually drilled through the grout that we did and we injected again. In the third trial, we got that QP down to zero. So this right here, this trial, trial two at location one, this is a potential callback or, you know, in a tunnel setting, as soon as the hydrostatic pressures come back or you have a rain event, then that, you know, that leak or that, that injected crack will leak again. And it was interesting to note here that we, <clears throat> we also saw some other locations that after we injected once, the QPs even went up. You see here trial two, now it's, this is a very small factor, but the QP increased. In location three, the QP increased after we injected. Now we got in both these locations, we got them to go down to zero, but this is another indication that we, you know, <clears throat> when we were doing the initial injection, perhaps because of the ex expansive forces and the pressures that we inject this in, you can actually like fracture these cracks more. You know, you can actually open some of these cracks up a little bit more than, you know, when they, than they normally would be. So um, it's just very interesting data to take away from crack injection that just isn't available out there, you know, with, uh, with other manufacturers and nobody's really broken injection down like this, you know, uh, to date. So this is something that we would, we would definitely recommend that we, <clears throat> we implement uh, to the, to the tunnel work there. And this doesn't have to be done every foot or even every five feet. You know, it's, it's definitely going to be the spacing and the amount of trials that you take, or I'm sorry, the amount of tests that you take is going to be um, a little bit of an arbitrary number, you know, come up with the, by the design team uh, based on total scope of the job. You know, if we have 15, 15 miles, it's going to be a little laborious and, you know, cost prohibitive to test every 10 feet, you know, so it would probably, what we'd recommend for something like this would be, um, you know, analogous to uh, like a core sampling or a pull test with coatings and things of that nature, where, you know, maybe we say we take the worst locations that we have and we make sure we get readings, you know, maybe every, on every, uh, you know, it, it depends, maybe every 15 feet, every 20 feet in the worst locations, and maybe between those locations, we can spread it out a little bit more. But yeah, that's something that has to be decided upon with, uh, with the design team. Okay, so <clears throat> moving on to um, the gas lamp uh, case study, and my apologies for talking so quickly here, but I'm just trying to, to get through it for you guys. So in the gas lamp, we had this, <clears throat> this was the actual building. So this was a, a below grade structure. You can see brick wall here. There's a little uh, speakeasy. It's really, really interesting uh, property here. It's part of the historic gas lamp district, as you can see. And in the rain events that we had last year, these brick walls just leaked like a sieve. So they had, they had several courses here. This is like four or five courses thick of brick substrate, and it was all just leaking. So we went down there and we took four locations. We took sample uh, QP factor readings, and these were the values that we came up with at, the, at those locations. So this was pretty significant. I mean, we were just drilling into the middle of brick here that you see in this testing port and taking a reading and getting readings of, you know, 50 to 60 just in the middle of brick itself, okay? So we came up with a grout plan, and what we wanted to do is we wanted to do an integral grout of polyacrylate gel. So integral grout meaning we didn't wanna inject the whole way behind the substrate, we actually wanted to inject into the brick porosity itself and into the joints. So what we did is we, we set up a, a QP testing port one, QP testing port two, and three in the middle. And we did our diamond shape going around those test ports. So this was our, the one, two, one through 10 is our order of grouting that we took. How far apart are those? So I believe these ones are 24 inches. Um, and I think I have some notes on that. If I would send you the, I can send you the, the note view of this. And what we did was we actually took our water tests. So when we took the first QP readings, we measured how far that water would travel. And that's how we laid out our, the, the spacing. Of the uh, of the ports, okay. So here's here's a picture of the actual substrate overlaid on the grout plan, 
and you can see the testing port was put into the middle, and then we have our one, two, three, and three. four around that. Okay, so sorry, was there any, any questions on that? No. Okay. So this was our grout plan. Um, we, you know, going into it, we really didn't know how well, you know, everything was gonna travel and, and how this was gonna work out for us. So we, we started injecting. Uh, let me see here if I can get this to move forward. Here was the, the QP system set up. This is the bucket of water. You just need a water source to run through this. Um, the, the flow and pressure transducers with 150 PSI pump are all self-contained in this battery operated uh, machine. And we take our, we were taking our water pressures like that. So we took our water pressures and this is what we came up with at QP at the testing location one, two, and three. So it supported the, the other four trials that we took a few weeks prior that this, this substrate had a, had relative permeability of anywhere from, you know, 45 ish to about 60 ish, which is a, a pretty significant um, leak through this. So here's our technical director, Charlie. He was actually sitting on a, on a women's toilet to do this, so that was a first for him. Um, but uh, what he would do is he started to inject this polyacrylate gel, and as we would inject it, you can see how porous you know, this grout is even on these. As he would inject it, we would take a little bit of oakum and we would stuff the oakum into the little pinholes with a screwdriver so you know, to keep the connectivity of the grout still flowing in the, uh, in the porosity. So what I'm showing here is the green grout holes are grout, grout sites that have actually been injected. So after we did four of these injection sites, we, took, we stopped grouting and we took our QP readings again. And when we took this, we had no idea what to expect, but we saw when we took it just after this one, two, three, and four ports, we got the QP at, at, at testing port one down to 1.35 or 97.2% reduction in, in permeability or connectivity. We moved, moved over to QP2 and it was still 48.99. So we had less than 1% effect down here, which is, you know, that's, that's reasonable to, to expect. And then QP3, we were surprised just after injecting these four, this testing port was already down to 5.67 or an 89.8% reduction of uh, a permeability in that substrate. Now <clears throat> I have these ones red five, six, and eight. Uh, the reason why I marked these in red that is when we injected over here, we got such good grout travel down into th these areas that we couldn't get any more take out of these three holes. Now you might say, well, why is the QP still high? And, you know, without seeing the inside of the wall, it's, you know, it's hard to say what, what the path of that water is, you know, running to the backside perhaps, or, or running vertically. It's really hard for us to, to deduce that uh, without seeing inside of it. So we continued to do the grouts in the, in the, the um, remaining holes that were accepting material. As you can see here, we were stuffing with oakum here, 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 here. So we were actually injecting up here and we were stuffing oakum. I think this was probably almost 30 inches away or so. So we were getting really good travel of, of grouts you know, through this brick substrate. And then when we finished, we took all the readings again and these were our, our results. Um, after we injected all the ports. So we, we had a 97.5% reduction in permeability here, a 99.6% reduction here, and a 100% reduction over here. So um, what, we, what we gave to the facility owner, um, to the, the building owner, was this QP reading. We showed them that when we started, uh, their QP values were as such here on those three testing ports. After the first treatment of four holes, we got the results down to here. And after we finished injection, we were down to here. So again, quantifiable results of, you know, of chemical grouting. So did you um, still have a leak? I'm sorry, go ahead. Was there still a leak then? Yep, so which leads us into this, this slide here. What about the trace amounts at QP one and three? Which is a very reasonable thing to say. You say, okay, well, yeah. you know, this yeah. is a, there's still trace QPs, so you have water, penetration. And you're exactly right. A couple things to keep in mind with this is that the, the pressure test, how we have the machine set up now, it's at 150 PSI and it's not adjustable. So it's a constant 150 PSI pressure test, which is equal to probably, you know, it's greater than 300 feet of head pressure. 
So one thing is that the, the pressure tests are probably a little bit extreme for most, you know, like say, let's say a basement, you know, sort of scenario like that. It was probably a little bit of a, an extreme pressure test, which could have led to some of it. And also, uh, one, one thing to keep in mind is that the AG200 product, and this is one of the slides that I skipped over, is a hydrophilic material. And the hydrophilic materials actually continue to expand when they're in contact with water. This was some, re this was some testing we did with AG200 in a capsule condition through an injection tube. And after, after injection, 12 hours of being wet, the QPs were actually still rising. In this, in this laboratory test up to 17.2. And after 184, we left, and we actually left it submerged in wet conditions. And after 184 hours, the QP actually decreases with the hydrophilic material over a period, in this case, of 184 hours where we got this down to 0. 0.4. So one Does of the things that we- Is that dependent on temperature too? I'm sorry? Is that dependent on temperature as well? Absolutely. So now here I'm trying to yeah. get, okay. get back on this. So what we offered the building owner was that, you know, and this was just one mock-up obviously, of, you know, one mock-up area they gave us. We did offer the building owner to come back out over the next two weeks and take these tests to see if in fact we could get these little trace amounts to take this path of performance. And um, they, they actually said it was good enough testing for their, you know, for their, uh, for their building and did not require us to do that. So that was the basis of the, the ICRI presentation. I know I cut through it very quickly. That's supposed to be a 45 minute <clears throat> presentation, but um, you know, I do want to point out that that's the, that's the type of uh, analysis that we want to bring to your project. Um, and, you know, it doesn't matter if you're using our grout or, or another grout or bubble gum, you know, a system like this will actually you know, quantifiably test whether we're actually sealing the, the substrate or not. So that's, um, <clears throat> that's the presentation on the QP system. Um, so do you guys have any, have any questions about that particular system? Well, thank you. It was very informative. It helped me a lot. And this is the first time I'm seeing it. You know, I think it might be kind of interesting, you know, to maybe come down and, you know, and do a couple of test areas just to see how the grout is performing. So this is something we can talk about and maybe add to the package somewhere down the road because this whole thing's still in the infant stage. But yeah, it'd be nice to, like I say, the way we always chase is, is, is just the visual. You watch and you watch the crack bleed. First it's bleeding a bunch of water. Then you see the foam start coming out. But you're right, you never know if you get it all the way in the middle or not. So it would be interesting to get some, uh, some you know, feedback from a system like this. But even if you did like a first pass yield, right, and you got 90% of it, we're still in a better position. Oh, well, absolutely, by far. And like you say, if you've got, that's where you come back with your second application. Which, so uh, yeah, which and, and yields it, you know, and, and protects it over the long run. So yeah, no, I, I think, this, what we're talking about is a good two-part system that allows you to work. And so this type of material, this is a polyacrylate gel. This has like a viscosity of like 20 centimeters. If you like to the naked eye, you can't tell the difference between this and water. So the material that we're looking at here, Jim, just so you're on the same page with us, is H100, right? And so H100, this was more of a curtain wall job. And what you guys are looking at is probably close to the crack injection side. That's we're going to be chasing the individual one. That's what exactly what we're looking at. So just the rule of thumb and just what we've seen after, I don't know, this, this technology has been around, I think, three decades at this point at least. What we've seen is that the first time that you go through this, you're going to get roughly 80% of this contained, right? Then you're going to go through and do a second pass. You're going to get 80% of what was left over. Sure. And you get a third pass here and you're going to get 80 more percent of what was left over from that. Theoretically, by doing that, you're going to seal off 98% of the leak. The problem is, is when you're when you have tunnels, you know, under a, a lake or you know, with hydrostatic. This is San Francisco. You put your finger in, in the dirt. You put your finger out. Water's gonna fill it. I mean, like, you just can't get around it. I mean, in, in a condition like this, we're getting ninety-eight uh, percent of something sealed or more. Oh, monstrous! And especially because, I mean, from what I'm hearing, it's like a 
it's not hard water, but it's water that's dripping into all the We have all that. We have salt water. Oh, yeah. You know, we've, we've got, uh, yeah. And what's amazing, we have the, all of our materials have such a chemical resistance. It doesn't matter if it's salt water or if it's hard water. It'll push it out. Yeah, so to, to touch on some of the stuff that Michael said, you know, having a system, though, some system where we can check QA, QC, and, and do water tests is really important in tunnel work, as you guys know. Um, you know. I've done quite a few tunnel projects. I've probably supported tunnels projects on five continents. And, um, you know, a lot of times mobilization is just ne next to impossible, you know, where we can only get in there maybe, you know, from midnight to 5 a.m. And, you know, mobilization mm -hmm. might be an hour and a half, teardowns an hour, whatever. And, you know, you just don't have the, you know, we don't have the ability or the luxury, I should say, in doing injection and then and then watching, you know, and observing. If yeah. they have to go back to a certain section of tunnel to regrout, you know, to Michael's 80%, you know, 80 20 rule, which is an accurate expectation in most cases. Um, You're absolutely right on that one because, yes, it's exactly what we have. When we're, we're looking on, on a weekday of like 1 30 to 4 in the morning. And on the weekends, they give us a little more time. We can grab another hour, but it's exactly like you just said. Yeah, we don't have the luxury of sitting there all day and watching it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So that's that's why we really want we really recommend trying to get a system in there that where we can test it before we demobilize. You know, so as they're actually doing the injection, you could have somebody coming behind them and testing those areas, you know, and if, and if we see that there's still a, a QP factor or it's still allowing, you know, the, the flow of water, then we, we automatically know at that point that we need to do, we need to regrout at that point and not wait, you know, for, uh, wait a month from now until we actually see the leak again. So in tunnel work, it's actually even more advantageous to, to implement something like that. But, um, but, you know, I have to say in a lot of cases, and we, we say this very openly to the industry, and we say this when we're in our seven, t you know, when I'm in the grouting committee meetings, you know, the, a lot of these products are, are quite similar to, to each other. You know, they're similar in, in chemical makeup. They're similar in mix, uh, you know, mixing rates and things like that. And it really comes down to the people that you have on site and the people that are, <coughs> you know, are, are directing the technique of it. And I, I think that's where, you know, we also... We also shine our, our our team is perhaps the most experienced in the industry at this point. You know, you, you have a team out here in California. I'm sorry. You have a team here in California. Yeah, so we uh, we do have Charlie Lehrman, who's our technical director, who you saw there. He he worked. Um, he was with Denis for many years, and then he was with Avanti for many years. If you know those brands, um, mm -hmm. he came. We used to use the Denis quite often. Okay. So he's, he's, he lives in Seattle, but he does, um, he's our technical services director in many areas. So he would be available for something like this to be on site. Um, I live in Southern California. Um, so I would be, avail I would be available uh, to be on site. And then, you know, depending on, you know, Michael lives in, in Arizona and, um, you know, depending on what contractor, you know, would ultimately do the work, uh, you know, we, we would definitely be on site. Uh, to okay. help out, not only take these these tests, these QP tests, but just to make sure that it's it's being done correctly. Sounds good. So, Jim, to bring you up to it too, um, in our initial conversations, uh, they initially discussed that BART was going to have its own internal crews that were going to be doing this sort of grouting. Is that still That's the case? Correct. That? Yeah, we've been doing it for thirty years. So, and we've used your product in the past. So, you know, what we're trying to do is go with something that the crew is familiar with that has worked for for them, you know, has, has good results and so forth and so on. So then the 100 is what we've been using in the past six, eight years, I guess. Um, and uh, yeah, we've had good results with that. And we pretty much stitch joints like you just said. So, you know, we've done our share of grouting. So yeah, we're just looking at, um, yeah. Just looking at some ways to verify that you know the, what we do. Right? Yeah, the, the, what we do is good. We want to verify that we are using the right product for the situations that we're in, and then we need to put a package together based on the quantity of leaks, you know, and what we think we can tackle in a year, so we can put a package together to purchase what we need to go out and 
start drying these things up. Yeah, sure. And, you know, another thing that you might want to think about, though, is the F400. Um, you know, the H100 is definitely a, a good product, but, um, you know, the F400 is what we, we do more crack injection. It's a more flexible material. You know, same, same mix. You have the same general ACC accelerator that you're going to mix with it. Um, same, same mixing ratios, same pumping equipment, same, same ports, but it does give a little bit more flexibility. So I, I don't want to get ahead of ourselves, but that is another product that you probably want to pull some data sheets on. You know, Michael can send you all the information on it, but um, I would certainly recommend when you say it. When you say it's more flexible, what, would, what exactly do you mean by that? So the H100 is, is considered a semi-flexible or semi-rigid material in the industry. And this is another thing that we talk about in the grouting committee, you know, really standardizing like a, an ASTM for elongation that would, that would tell, say that a product is either rigid, semi-rigid, semi-flexible or, or flexible because as the industry stands right now, it's a little bit of a marketing, it's a little bit of marketing jargon for all of that. You know, they'll say semi-flexible, but that could mean semi, semi-rigid. So the H100 is in that class, semi-rigid slash semi-flexible. And what that means is that under, under uh, confinement, it actually becomes quite, quite stiff. So if we were to do like void filling um, in a curtain grouting scenario that Michael alluded to earlier, or if we were doing a void filling under a slab, you would actually get some compressive, <coughs> some compressive capabilities out of the H100 if it's injected under confinement. Whereas the F400 remains flexible. We're going to be looking probably at about a, I believe it's a 200% elongation with the F400. I can, I can fact check that, but um, I believe it's about 200%. And just in, in, you know, areas in seismic areas or in metro conditions where you have a lot of vibration, um, you know, against the substrate, the, the flexible materials typically perform a little bit better in the, in the long term. And you're going to look at temperature cycling as well. They can all handle it. The F400 is just going to be able to, to shift around with the concrete significantly better. I mean, I'm not, I'm not as familiar with uh, tunnels that are going to be under a body of water. This is my first time going into one, which is funny enough, but I don't know what the temperature cycling is on there. If you have like the full ocean effect, but the, the 400 is definitely the, the route you want to look at just because it can, the survivability of it is significantly better. So you'll send us the MSDS. Yeah, I, I, have them, I have them right here on my laptop. I can email them as soon as we get off the presentation. And I know that we have, um, you have, uh, Ed, you have the binder that uh, we sent over to you as well. That has all of our all of our products on it. No, I don't. But yeah, you don't. I can I can send it. I can give you a digital version. That's fine. Yeah. Digital is better. Yeah. You guys have enough of the funny binders over there to, to last a lifetime. Okay. Well, I guess we have some things to talk talk about. Yeah, but it's, 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 it's very informative. I appreciate the time a little better idea of what the whole mm -hmm. injection process is about. Yeah. yeah. And, you, and you can't do anything bigger. What is that, like a half inch? I mean, we can go up to a five eighths, but after that, I mean, you're going to start compromising. Yeah. But they, I mean, we, we prefer to do pressure, though. Yeah, same, 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 same pressure. Thing. Yeah, but, but uh, yeah. Um, but we... Yeah. Well, we could do... Sorry. Yeah. Chipped out. Right. Well, that calls for a different repair there. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah, if you're seeing like small concrete, is that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's a whole. We have some. We have some rotten concrete. The whole other deal. So that's that's a whole. Yeah. Now the um, well, what we recommend actually is for those packers, we would recommend a three eighths. And the reason for that is the, is the smaller the hole. The, the more like uh, the more structural integrity of the concrete itself. Will Correct. Be. Yeah, we don't want to turn our tunnels into Swiss cheese. Oh, okay. We prefer the three eighths packers. Um, yeah, I noticed that uh, one on your website. I saw the half inch ones there. Mm -hmm. You see the three eighths. We do have a three eighths. I can okay. make sure I can send you a catalog yeah. and choose whichever one you want. Yeah, no, no, we would prefer the three eighths. Okay. And if that doesn't slow you down, it's it, it, it's easier to quicker. Yeah. You know it's what I mean? Like you say, you you you. Maybe a little smaller hole as opposed to a bigger hole. You know, honestly, the biggest the biggest thing is when you're doing crack injection jobs, it's more on labor than on material. 
Sure. Right? Because honestly, especially the van. Ex exactly. And you're going to laugh at this too. I mean, you can spend, let's say you have an hour dedicated to doing crack injection, 45 minutes of it will be drilling holes and prepping equipment. Like 15 minutes of it is actually. The, the material through the wall, yeah. right? And that's what you're going to suffer through. And I mean, using a 3 8 drill bed from a contractor side, they'll prefer doing that over even half an inch. Yes. I mean, it's such a minute difference, but I mean, it, it makes all the difference when you're trying to do, when you're trying to get three and a half hours of work accomplished. And so we want to make sure that you guys get this done as quick as possible, because I'm guessing there's, there's probably some form of deadline. People are going to be pissed off because they can't ride on the train at 1.30 in the morning, right? We want to make sure these things can happen as quickly as possible for you. Yes. As always, we want to come in under budget and under time constraint, right? Yeah. Yeah. Makes everybody happy. So, so Michael, I'm um, going to butt in a little bit. So to, to that point, is there, is there any schedule or timeline for, for any site walks? Is there any exploratory work, anything of that nature that we could? I'm just putting together the uh, project initiation. Uh, paperwork for this. Um, both Julia and Ed have provided me with a lot of preliminary information that we're going to need. Um, so I, I, I'm putting it together. Um, the idea would probably be it could be ready anytime to submit once we have all our facts. So it can happen very quickly. Okay. And are there are there SDSs, NSF certificates, TDSs, anything you need from us? Not yet. Not yet, but there will be. Okay. Now, we, we do also have a, a building a leak seal methodology brochure. It's about a five-page brochure on, you know, choosing packers, choosing pumps, choosing material. Is that anything that could be Yeah, yeah send us what you got. Yeah, we'll yeah. look it over. Yeah, we're going to, yeah. We're trying to look like, you know, yeah, I would like to see what your method is, what you recommend in the way of packers, you know, airless pumps, so forth and so on. So I'm trying to buy into a system, if you know what I mean. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Like we use this grout for this, and we use this size pump for this, and we recommend the wash, and then maybe... Uh, you know, every six months you actually flush things out or you soak this, um, you know. Probably every night. <laughs> yeah, it's a well, yeah. So, yeah, you know, I'm, like I said, I'm looking into, you know, the whole system. Well, yeah, it's easier for, for our internal labor to, to get some, you know, we get some strong unions and to try to like circumvent those groups to have an outside contractor come in and do it is very tricky, so. Yeah, not only that too, by the time we escort the contractor in and out, we can do the work ourselves. And like I say, this is kind of work we've been, I've been grouting for 30 years, so, you know, we, I remember the first grout I ever pumped, I pumped out of a little uh, one gallon grease can. Before oh, they had the air, this is, yeah. 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 In fact, I think the first grout we used was the pen grout, Japanese grout, yeah. yeah, yeah. So we we yeah, that, that does go back stuff. some years. Way with the systems. Yeah, not many people reference those products. So that's you. You've definitely been around it for for a couple of years. That's for sure. But uh, right. no, yeah, we we can certainly help you out though. Uh, we you know we we do supply all of those packers. You know a few different pumps. Um, you know, the accessories with injection needles, oakum, surface sealants, things like that. So, you know, I think, uh, I think we could definitely support what you guys are trying to do. And Mike, that stuff you can send us? Yeah, I, I'll send it right after we get off the phone here. Beautiful. You'll have it in your email before you can sit on your chair. That's efficiency, right? Well, Michael, now you have to well, deliver on that. Yeah, I know. Well, he, he sits in another building, so <laughs> I got time, Jim. <laughs> We'll see okay. are, there, are there any are there any specific um, sections or challenges uh, that you have in the tunnels that, that we could help with? Are there you know is this pretty straightforward cracking and, and joint work or you know, do we have any areas that are that are in worse condition you know than others? Well, 
You know, it's not just crack injection. And yes, we have some tunnels that are, you know, we've done some major repair work in already because of all the um, water intrusion. But uh, essentially here, what we are looking at is, and it's true, we're under the time constraints. You know, we don't get in there until the trains quit running. And um, yeah, but essentially for now, what we're looking at is, is crack injection because we have, uh, I couldn't even tell you how many leaks we have. Even a lot of the new stuff leaks a whole lot too. So <laughs> we just need to get on top of this. Plus we're replacing a lot of the infrastructure. We're putting in new high voltage cables, 34,500 volt cables, 1,000 volt cables. Eventually we're gonna have a new train control system in that. We're putting in new third rail, we're putting in new running rail, and we're gonna experience all the same problems that have caused a lot of this stuff to go south on us if we don't attack one of the biggest problems, which is water intrusion. And we don't need the water dripping on the running rail or a thousand volt cables or on our tunnel lighting or train control systems. So that's why we need to get rolling on this stuff. Yeah, sure. Now, I, I it sounds like you guys are very, very well versed with crack crack injection. Have you also done a fair bit of curtain grouting? No. Okay. That's another another brochure, Michael, if you could make a note of that to send them the curtain grout brochure. Roger. I think that that may be something to take a look at, especially in some areas and maybe where we have um, you know a lot of cracking in one area. It might be a expedient way to go about it more so than just addressing the cracks. And uh, we do have a nice animation video that our marketing team just came up with. I'll, Michael, if you could send them that link as well. Yeah, it's really yeah, nice. Yeah, I, I would say 90% of what we have, but we do have a few locations like he's just described where probably the curtain grouting might be a better way to go where we have a multitude of cracks in a very small location, you know what I mean? So the, sure. in a situation like that, Maybe the curtain writing would be, you know, a better way to go. Sure. Yep. And are these are these constantly leaking? Yes. In fact, I've got a crew running right now, and they're coming up with they're quantifying all the cracks throughout the systems on all the different lines and so forth and so on. And we're going to put this package together with this information and point out the obvious that. You know, all these cracks are cracks that are leaking in the summertime. So you can imagine when winter comes around, it'll probably increase one third again as much. Yeah, yeah, some sometimes. Um, is there any, there probably isn't much fluctuation in temperature down there. Is no, that... it's pretty constant down there. Yeah, when you're, um, yeah, the tunnels, so you, don't, you don't get major fluctuations in temperature. Okay. Yeah. I don't I mean. think temperature will be a big issue. Just hydrostatic pressures. Hydrostatic pressure. We have a lot of that. Yeah. And and what is the what is the depth at that point? The depth well, of the lake. It's, you know the the most of the tunnels are cut and cover tunnels. So yeah, you know they're shallow. like yeah twenty feet deep or something. Like that. However, the Transbay too, which we've done considerable amount of grouting in, is anywhere from yeah, I think 60 to about 180 feet deep. Um, and then we have the stretch of tunnel that goes underneath the estuary right here. And I'm, that's got to be what? 20, 30 feet deep there? Oh, yeah, okay. something like that. Before you get and then, the SBPX, we have a total of 69 tunnels. Now, and two more, I would, I would say 12 tunnels in total mm -hmm. in the system that we need to. Constant monitoring. Yeah, 12 tunnels at 15 miles. So, uh, no, this is just a, a conservative uh, amount. And then the new tunnel under Lake Elizabeth and just south of Fremont is uh, that's underwater all the time and it's it has a considerable amount of leakage and it's brand new. So we should we need to get on top of that one in the near future. That's not even going there. <laughs> I, I've mentioned that many times. It's one of those things. It's not our fault, but it's our problem now. <laughs> yeah, we'll try to buy it and go a little bit. We bought it, we own it, we yeah. need to fix it. Yeah, that's what's called. It's filled. 
they signed off on it, and we had no say. We're used to that. Uh, All right, I have a three o'clock, so I got to cut out. But I appreciate your time, Jim, Michael, Randy. I'll send it over to you immediately. Yeah, very good. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. 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 Yeah, he's the one who's going to fund us the money. Oh, I'm going to find it. Oh my God. It's not coming out of my pocket.